I'm going to go ahead and start talking then if you'll just keep an eye on that for me. Sure. All right. Thank you. And Jerry, um, you can all say hi to Jerry. You've gotten emails from her before. She is the CEO of Theria Labs and she's popping into eavesdrop hey. on us um, to say hello and rock her green shirt. Oh, and now in space. Um, uh, but she might have to leave to go take care of other business um, at some point during this. Um, so we're going to just, again, take a minute. I'm going to mute everybody uh, just for a second while I'm talking. I did give you the ability to unmute yourself. Um, so you can do that. And I'm closing the participants bar. So um, hopefully Lois and Joanna, you can keep track of that for me. So anyway, hi, I'm Amber. I'm the one that's been sending you emails. I'm the education specialist for Feria Labs. Very quick intro about me. Um, I was a teacher for 15 years. This is my first year working full-time for Feria Labs. Um, I taught mostly middle school in that 15 years, sixth through eighth grade, um, but I was also a gifted specialist and um, I got, I was mostly a math teacher. I did national board certification in math. Uh, before moving to computer science um, and was a beta tester for Feria Labs when they launched Codespace and then they stole me out of the classroom. So that's my short version of my story. Um, and then Lois, Wave Lois and Joanna are both teachers um, in middle and high school who use our products, use Codespace. <laughs> Michelle, is that Pee Wee's Playhouse? Yes, it is. Michelle just showed up in Pee Wee's Playhouse. See, the backgrounds, that's how we get derailed. But yeah, by next time, I expect everyone's going to have a super cool background and not just our offices or kitchen or anything. Um, so they're going to be helping us out today. Um, we strive to use differentiation and meet everybody where we are, even if where we are is virtual. Um, so we can definitely break off and do smaller groups if we need to, because some people are in different places right now. Um, Lois and Joanna, is there anything else you want to say about yourself? I'll give you a second. Joanna says no. Lois, you're still on mute. Um, you can hold the space bar down while yeah. you talk. There you go. Um, we're all on this journey together. <laughs> and um, I think it's just good for us to take a break, even from our students for a second, and just see some adult faces. Um, so it's a good thing. I've been seeing faces. They've just been little faces, <laughs> little big middle school faces. So it's good. Yeah, my kids decided to make me feel like I was in the classroom today. And I found five really good, almost brand new pencils with no erasers. And I about lost my mind. So they just wanted to keep it real. Um, so I want to remind you all uh, to follow us on social media. We're at Feria Labs on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, we are not as active on Instagram as the other two just because Jerry likes Twitter the best and I like Facebook the best. So we kind of handle those two. Um, and we have a Facebook group called Code Space Teachers. Um, which you can access either in a link in my email signature or if you can't find it, I can send you that way. Um, but we're getting, that was something that was born out of requests from teachers. They wanted kind of a um, PLN on Facebook where they could ask questions and such. So that's starting to get a little bit busier there. Outside of these webinars, I have daily office hours on Zoom, Monday through Thursday, that's 12 to one central. And on Friday, that's three to four. And that's just because we have our weekly team meetings um, at 11 on Friday. So I didn't wanna have to request to everyone to move that. Um, but I can send out the link to that Zoom um, to everybody who's here. So you'll have that, but office hours is just like what you're doing for your students. If you're working on a project and you have a question and you just want some FaceTime with me, you can just jump in there and we can do a screen share or whatever. So I can help you with whatever project you're working on. Um, so that's office hours. Thank you, Joanna, for posting the Facebook group in the chat. I'm, I'm trying to watch the chat box, but I know I'll get um, distracted. Uh, so that's daily office hours um, for the webinars. 
We have a series of four webinars planned right now. I will add more if there are requests for it. Tomorrow, um, the title originally of tomorrow's webinar was using Google Classroom with Codespace, which is typically what I would do um, in like a live PD. Uh, however, it's kind of changed to like teaching virtually with uh, Google Classroom and Codespace. And just today we launched our teacher dashboard so you can do progress monitoring, Jerry's jumping up and down. You can do progress monitoring of your students with the teacher dashboard. And so we'll cover that as well. So it's not just gonna be Google Classroom. You can also use Codespace with other learning management systems. It's just that Google Classroom is embedded in it. However, I know that not all of you are classroom teachers or you might not be using this with your entire class. So if that, um, that topic doesn't really apply to you, it's fine if you don't join us tomorrow. Or you might just, you know, put your headphones in and listen uh, just to get the information. But um, we'll have, hopefully Joanna will be here tomorrow too. She's a Google certified educator. Um, and so she'll be able to answer any kind of Google Suite specific questions. I've used Google Classroom with my middle school students with great success. So um, those are, both topics I think we need to go through. The teacher dashboard is brand new for everybody. It's going to be launching new features throughout the year um, next year. We wanted to make sure we had a rollout for everyone right now since we're all doing virtual. Um, but yeah, next year there will be more fun things. Um, and Andrew, I will record tomorrow's session. Um, and I haven't started recording today yet, but I'm going to once we actually get started. Um, the other webinars that we will cover is assessing students and uh, using Remix projects, which you'll know what that is later. And I don't remember what the other one was. I wrote it down, but I forget. So anyway, and also of course we'll take requests. You guys are a cohort, so I hope that we can kind of get to know each other and use each other to lean on. Um, so we will continue to learn together. Before I go to the slides, if you have any questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask or ask in the chat box. And I'll wait. Amber, do people need to register to get the video? That's a good question. I don't think so because I'm just going to save it as like um, an mp4 file and then we'll post that on our YouTube channel. So that'll be open. Any other questions? All right. Then what I'm gonna do is, I've got just a couple slides that outline what we're gonna do today. I'll throw the link to those slides in the chat box here, um, but then we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, to everyone. You don't really need the slides right now, but there's some links and things in there, so you might want them. Um, and hopefully the sharing permissions are fine on that. All right, I am going to share my screen. All right, okay. All right, once again, if, um, if you have any questions, of course, you can ask in the chat box, but if you need to unmute yourself, oops, need to move this out of the way. All right, I'm gonna go into presentation mode. So today, down and dirty, uh, intro to Python using code space. So uh, we have the micro bit and the code bot. Got both of these. You're gonna use the micro bit today. Hopefully you have yours within arm's reach, but you might need to <laughs> go and get it if you do not. All right, moving to the next slide. All right, just some general housekeeping. Um, as a habit in meetings, of course, you wanna keep yourself on mute unless you are speaking. Um, while on mute, I learned this like last week, you can hold down the space bar while you talk to temporarily unmute yourself, which is really good if you're just participating in asking questions. Um, you can always use the chat option to ask questions. That's why Joanna and Lois uh, and Jerry have joined us today. So they can uh, keep, keep us posted. If there's an immediate need, you can raise your hand 
um, and ask your question if you really need us to, to stop. Uh, generally, just like with our students, if you have a question, then probably somebody else in the group has the same question. So if there's no need to just keep it to yourself and ask later, you're welcome to interrupt and ask questions. Um, and we will record and post these if you want to view it again, if it's going too fast or you just want to see something again, that way you'll be able to play and pause. And then I already mentioned this, but the daily office hours are Monday through Thursday, 12 to 1, and then Friday, 3 to 4. All right, I am going to record now, if it will. Okay, I believe it's recording. Okay, moving on. All right, again, you do not need to do this immediately, but these are the websites that I bookmark for myself um, when using, when I was a teacher using Codespace especially. Um, the Fairy Labs website, we have our uh, links to resources there. There's a quick link to Codespace. All of our teacher resource links are there. Um, so either bookmark it or just commit it to memory. The teacher resources are right now all in Google Drive. Um, that will change at some point to make them a little bit more locked down. Um, so they might be behind the um, paywall for subscribing, but right now they're all available. If you print them all out, they can make a pretty substantial binder. Um, so you can, if you're a virtual person, then just copy those all to your folder. If you're a paper person, then you can print them out. Um, if you go to any of our week-long professional development, we always supply that. So I guess I can plug Pathfinder, so that's our summer week-long series, but we can talk about that later. Um, but the teacher resources are numerous. They are in Google Drive because we expect you to edit them for your specific need. Uh, the support page has a lot of questions, the answers to questions that you may have, especially when you're just getting started and you're trying to figure out how to get on and um, how to get your students on. So check there because there's pictures and instructions and everything. And then last but not least, Codespace. So that's where we are going to go next. So um, if you want to do a split screen, you can. I will try to remember to show you something and then stop and give you time to try it and then come back. So if you just want to swipe back and forth between two screens, you can do that. But you are going to open up Codespace now and I am going to go there as well. Flipping to Codespace. Okay. So the first time that you log in, you're going to sign in with Google. So when you click sign in with Google, choose the account that you want to use. Now I will tell you, um, I use my teaching account to demo. And so I will frequently delete my progress so that I can show students what it looks like for them for the very first time. So my personal Gmail actually has all of my continuous progress, all of my XP, all of my projects, everything, because I'm kind of like anal like that, and I wanted to be able to keep that forever. So right now you're participating as a student, not a teacher. So it's kind of a judgment call for you. Do you want to just use your personal Gmail account or do you want to use your school account? Um, if you use your school account and Tomorrow, we're working in Google Classroom. Most schools have their privacy set so that you cannot join a Google Classroom outside of your school domain. So that's something else to think about. And I will pause and wait and see if there's any questions about that. All right. I don't see or hear any questions, so I'm going to continue on. 
The first time you log into CodeSpace, you will get this guided tour. Um, I do recommend when you do this to students that you make them go through it with you because otherwise they will not read and there's a lot of information here that's actually useful. Um, if you want to skip it, you can just hit enter, 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 and, and just go through the whole thing. Um, so the editor panel, what you need to know about this, it looks like a Google Doc. That's on purpose. That's because students are very comfortable with Google Docs and they kind of intuitively know where things are. Whatever you type in this editor panel will automatically save in the root folder of your Google Drive. So right now you have a doc in your Google Drive called Untitled Program. Okay, so it's going to be there. It's yours forever. Um, even if you never use Codespace again, you're still going to have that. The curriculum selector automatically starts on free trial microbit. We will use that share token I sent you, which at this moment, I already forgot what it is, um, <laughs> because it's not the one I normally use, but you're gonna use that share token to get access to the full curriculum. And we'll do that after we finish this tour. The lesson panel is step-by-step -step instructions. You really need to read all of these steps. It's not fluff. Um, we say this every time and every teacher I know reads this and they nod when I say that and I'm guilty too. Like I, nine times out of 10, if I have a problem with my code, it's because I skim something and I didn't read it. And if I go back and read it, then I will know what I missed. Um, and the students will start saying to each other, cause this is what I say to them. Your question indicates you have not read the instructions. Generally, the question that they ask will be answered in there. And I saw we had a, a chat, so if I need to stop, just let me know. I'm watching Joanne and Lois. Um, your XP is your experience points. It's just a little gamification. Uh, some of your students will be extremely motivated by this. Others will not. The only thing I ask you is to make this a fun part of the experience and do not tie this to any grades. It's not intended to be used that way. You know that students will work around the system if you tie it to their grades. So just make it something fun um, for your competitive students. They'll love it. For the ones really in gaming and stuff, they'll love it. But for everybody else, you do not want to tie it to their grade. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, progress bar just shows you how far through that particular project you are. The project menu allows you to jump in between different projects. So you can go from project one to four to seven. Um, this is particularly helpful if you're just teaching a couple projects or if you want to refer back to something you've already done. The toolbox. This is going to be the storage place for vocabulary words and other important concepts. Anytime you see something in blue with a little tool icon, you want to click it. Because when you do, that gets added to your toolbox. Um, it's either going to be an explanation of a concept or a term, and then inside the toolbox, you can click on other things. It will also show you documentation of Python. So that's pretty cool too. Um, if you don't click on it when you see it, you don't know when you might need that again and you won't have it in your toolbox. Joanna or Lois, anything to add about those? For those competitive kids, it also helps them add to their points. So that's mm -hmm. a good way to put it out there to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, to just say, hey, you're collecting yeah. the points too. Joanna? Um, I was going to say the same thing, but Lois beat me to unmuting <laughs> her mic. Um, just on another side note, I am shutting off a couple of people's video because Amber, you're breaking up a little bit. So I okay. just want it, that can help with bandwidth. So I'm just trying to do that on the back end. Not that we don't like seeing people, we're just trying to make it so you <laughs> can all hear Amber. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know if I can, I can only mute or unmute everyone together. I can't turn off everybody's video, but yeah, if Joanna and Lois, if you would leave your, I know Lois, you just turned yours off. If you would leave yours on so I can kind of just watch you, but if everyone else would turn off their video, that will definitely help um, with the 
the bandwidth. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the next step. So the next step is important because it, students are not allowed to progress to the next step unless they've done everything that they're supposed to do on that page, which is that accountability piece that goes into the Google Classroom thing that we'll talk about tomorrow. Um, so that's it. That's the end of the tour. Now, before we move on, we are going to put in our share token, which by the way, since we're talking about this, everyone has access to the first two projects in the free trial. So even if you have micro bits from another source, if you just load our firmware on it, everyone can use the code space editor and anyone can do the first two projects. But to unlock everything, you'll have to put in that share token. So to do that, it says you're on a free trial, click here to enable all content. We're gonna do jumpstart Python. You don't currently have an active share token. So here is where you're going to enter the one that I sent to you. If you, Lois and Joanna, you don't need to change yours. Um, and I actually don't remember the one that I sent to you because it's not one we've ever used before. Um, Melissa posted it. She yeah. said it was unscrambled, merited. That sounds right. Thank you, Melissa. And then click validate. All right, so this shows the curriculum modules. We want to make sure that Jumpstart Python is in yellow and then click activate. So as a teacher, when you buy, um, if you buy like a Jumpstart kit, you have 10 micro bits and 10 simultaneous licenses. So you can see how many of your students are logged in at any one time. So if you have let's say you get three Jumpstart kits, you have 30 licenses. First period comes in, they log in, they work on code space, they use those 30 seats, they log out. Second period logs in, now they use those 30 seats. So these seats are assigned to you. They are simultaneous logins. They're not assigned to a specific student. Um, like I know some, some programs do it that way where it's you have to buy a seat for each student it's just simultaneous logins and there is no yearly subscription fees. Like once you get this, this is yours forever. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, I'm going to wait a second because I see we only have six people um, logged in. I know a couple of people might already have a license because they're um, experienced users. But if you need a couple minutes, or if you have a question, you're struggling, you can either direct a question in the chat box to Joanna or Lois, or raise your hand or unmute yourself and tell us to hold up so you can get logged in. I'm practicing wait time. It's really awkward when I'm in my office by myself. Hey, it's Brandy. Yes. Hi, Brandy. Okay, so I've I'm on the curriculum module selection. Uh huh. And it, it it won't let me pick the Jumpstart Python. I've got my Python with robots. I see that active in the check mark mm -hmm. and all that, but the activate course doesn't open okay. or get to a spot where I can put in my share token. So yours is a special case because you're already using a different curriculum. You're using okay. robots. So um, if you will change share token. Okay. And put an unscramble merit in, that should work. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And sorry, that's going to be, you'll have to switch it back to get back to your Python with robots. That's okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Will it save my space if I do that? What do you mean, will it save your space? So let's say I'm three quarters or more through the Python with robots. Um, if I switch out my token, it's still going to keep the place where I was at when I yes. switched the, the token back. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I see there's a few questions in the chat box. I can take a second to read those. All right. I know a lot of you have um, already had a um, loaner kit from us, so you don't need to use the Unscramble Merida because you have your own license key. So I'm going to, unless anyone stops me, go ahead and assume that everybody's logged in and we're ready to get started. Okay, so moving on to the next step. 
I'm going to go through these really quickly. You can read through these in all of your free time that you have now, which is a joke because you're trying to parent and homeschool your kids and teach and do a million things. So that's completely sarcastic. All right, all of these symbols that you see throughout the way, um, notify the student there's something to do. The important ones are type in the code and run your program. We'll also talk about debugging. Um, you will see along the way, there are some purposeful bugs built into the code that's to teach the student something specific. We'll talk about a couple of those as we um, go on. Purple light bulb is a new coding concept. Physical interaction means you have to do something with your micro bit and then test your knowledge questions. You have to answer a couple little quiz questions to move on. If there's any questions, unmute yourself now and I'm going to click next. All right, so the micro bit is an awesome little processor. It's got so much built into it um, that makes it just really perfect to use with students. It's a lot stronger than it looks. Um, they're pretty hardy. They're um, a lot harder to break than you would think. And I've used these with hundreds of middle school students, so I can attest that they really do stand up um, to teenagers. Um, and we're gonna do all sorts of projects with the micro bit. Uh, so this is one of the test your knowledge questions. Um, we do talk about how you could, because the kids always want to know, can I blow it up? No, you can't blow it up. You're not, well, I guess you could blow it up, but we're not going to blow it up. But really static electricity is the biggest danger to it. Um, I haven't had a classroom with carpet, but if you do have a carpeted classroom, um, especially in the winter when it's a little bit drier, teach your students to kind of use their knuckle to ground themselves before they touch any kind of electronics. Um, so with the test your knowledge question, obviously I've already answered this one, um, but just notice that my options are in a different order than your options. So if you're doing this with students, you don't wanna say, oh, the correct answer is C. Well, for me, it was the third option, touch some grounded metal, but they're all in a different order. I'm going to stop because I see we have some chat questions. Okay, it looks like you guys got it handled, so I'm going to ignore that for now. Um, I'm not going to read all of these to you, but just note that to learn more about the parts of the micro bit, all of these red tags have more information. Same with the front. Um, in the second program, we are going to use the buttons A and B. Uh, well, mostly the A button. So when it refers to press button presses on button A, it means the button on your micro bit. All right, so let's get hooked up. You're going to use the USB to connect the micro bit to your computer and then click next once it's connected. Hey, Amber. Yeah. Um, can you hang on just a minute? Um, we're needing to, I'm not real sure where you are because I was doing work, but we do have the question, um, how do you open unit one? Okay, so you should be in unit one right now. Um, if you are not, if you click on the project menu and click on one, it'll take you to 1.1. You can use the advance button if you've already do have done these steps to get back to where we are. Okay. And before that though, there's uh, it's a tour that you go through, correct? And then mm -hmm. following the tour and the different prompts will take you, get you to the 1.1. Am I correct? Uh, the tour is 1.1. Okay. Got it. All right. Michelle, you can give us a Go ahead if you're ready or if you have a question you can ask. Do my co-hosts have it under control? I see kind of a nod from Joanna. <laughs> Not seeing another question in the chat, so I think we're okay. Okay. Oh, 
she said she's not advancing to the next section. So when you she's click not. at the advance arrow in the top right hand corner, it's not advancing, Michelle? So where I am, mm -hmm. it now says project symbols. Okay. For 1.2 first steps. And so I get, you know, you type your code and you do all that. But from mm -hmm. here, did you just click next to move on? I did. Scroll down to the bottom and click next. And then you have to scroll to the Is bottom. Is that the same as the right arrow on the top right of the, of the window? It's not exactly the same. And that's a really good question. So I actually don't really um, tell the students about clicking advance at the top. The next button down here is checking for completion of everything on the page. Now, obviously right now we're just kind of reading and going through it. So there's not really anything to check for. Um, and if you click next and haven't completed all the steps on the page, it'll pop up some kind of error message. Like you need to go back and do a step. Um, so that's an actual check. Advance is more something that I use as a teacher because I'm not, when I'm demonstrating or I'm helping students, I'm not necessarily going through every step, right? I'm just going where I need to go. So you can always advance without completing something. But if you click next and you haven't completed something, it will stop you and prompt you to do something. Is that the point where you said your new teacher dashboard feature will identify items that are not completed? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. That's a really good question. I'm glad you um, stopped and made sure everybody um, understood the difference between those two. Um, so once you're in the USB symbol and you can click the green connect USB, this will be black if you're already connected. It will be gray if you are not. And our USBs are generally intelligent. And remember, if you've plugged something into that USB before, um, I will tell you, um, if your USB does not connect, um, there's a couple of common problems. One is if you're operating a Windows machine that has something before Windows 8, um, you at home probably don't have this problem, but there are still lots of schools that are using um, Windows machines that are older. Um, with my students, we were a one-to-one -one school that had uh, MacBook Airs and they just, you know, recycled the same computers over and over. And the USB is probably the first thing to go out. Um, I think they get food in them and all sorts of other nastiness. And so if it doesn't work on one side, I tell them just try it on the other side in a different USB. Um, but those are the two most common problems um, with getting your USB connected. And I will make sure that everyone is good to go before I move on. Okay, and then next. All right, so we try to teach students to name their files um, with something descriptive. We can encourage it, but they still have to do it. So each time we create a new program, you're going to name the file to state its purpose. So inside here, we are going to call this heart one. Um, each time you do a new program, it will be called entitled program. If your students do not give it a descriptive name when prompted, they're going to have a whole bunch of files called untitled program in their Google Drive. At some point when it tells you to go back and look at a program you did before, it's going to come back to bite them that they didn't do that. Um, so it is to their best benefit to name it each time. If they don't, they'll learn the hard way why we do that. All right, we've named our file. So now that has replaced the untitled program in your Google Drive. I told you earlier you had a program called, or a doc called Untitled Program. Now your doc is called Heart One. Next. Okay. Each lesson in CodeSpace has an objective. In this very first lesson, the only thing that we want you to learn is that in Python, capitalization and punctuation matter. Relax, you're not going to break anything, but programming languages are very strict. 
So where it says type in the code, you're going to click in the editor panel and you are going to use these two lines of code, use two separate lines, press enter after the star. So we're going to do from microbit import star and display dot show image heart. So I'm going to pause so you can go to that screen and do that. And then we'll talk about it. I just put from microbit image. Oh my goodness. Just check in the chat box while I'm waiting. Thank you for helping Erin. Okay, so to run your program, you can click show me how to run your code. And you have the run button. And at this point, you want to show, look at your micro bit, you should see a heart. If you do not, that is okay. It just means you have an error. So here are some common mistakes. Um, it's very common for students to just capitalize the H in heart. So if I do that and I click run, it doesn't just say that there is a runtime error. It says online to check capitalization of heart. So if I compare here to here, go back and forth, I can see, ah, I should have capitalized that. Um, if I forget that star from microbit import star and I click that on line one, saw end of line, but expected either a parentheses, a name or a star or so on. So it's okay if you get an error message the first time, because that's exactly what your students are gonna do. Um, when code spaces are created, they put in these student friendly error messages. So it's not just here's a runtime error, here's a syntax error, but here's how to fix that error. The goal is that the students can do it on their own. So hopefully we have all got our heart. I wish I could see all your videos right now. This is the most fun part. Do you see a heart on your display? If yes, click yes and you get your XP and you move on to the next step. Now the micro bit has many more built in images. I told you anytime you see a blue word with a tool to click on it. So when we did that import statement, import star, star means to import all of the micro bit library included in that all the predefined images that you can make on the micro bit. This right here, this will keep your students very entertained for quite a while. Um, and even very young students, my own children love to just plug in the micro bit and put different images on them. Um, as long as they can type, they can do this part. So definitely encourage some playtime with that. Um, also, you're going to have students that say, well, I want to make a star. Let's just say that because I know star is not in the micro bit library. Then you can show a different image if you look at the documentation. So the intention of having this one click away is when programmers want to know how to do something, they go to the documentation and they look it up. So we know that students, some students are going to want to go deeper faster. Well, it's just one click away. You can click on this blue word and see more information about it. Okay, here's how to make an X. I know that if I look here, zero means the LED is off, nine means the LED is on max, so I can make a big giant X on my micro bit, so they could definitely figure out how to do a star. Now imagine if all of this text was on the lesson panel in the very first lesson. That would turn off a lot of kids because it's just a lot to read. So again, the amount of text to read is intended to be like down and dirty. This is what you need to know. But if you want to find out something more, you can click what is an underscore? What else can I do with images? What are the built in images? So you have all of those just one click away. Another place that you can go for help is obviously the help menu. Very frequently, I would have a student come up to me and say, 
I want to do this with my micro bit and I don't know how to do it. And I say, okay, well, let, I don't have time to figure it out right now. Cause I've got, you know, 24 other kids that are asking me questions, but give me till tomorrow. I'll look it up and I'll let you know. And so I go to the micro bit documentation and I would scroll through and I would say, okay, here's how the accelerometer works. And I would figure it out. And the next day I would say, Celeste, I figured out how to do it. And she'd go, oh, I already figured it out. Um, but we, again, we teach the students to go to that documentation because that's in industry. That's what real programmers do. They go to the documentation, but they don't know how to do something and they figure it out. When you're doing something like this, you have to be very comfortable saying, I don't know, let's figure it out together. And that is okay. They need to see that from you. Um, before I hit next, I'm going to check the chat. Thank you for helping. <laughs> Brandy says, love the toolbox feature and additional information. Didn't know this. It's my fault, Brandy, I never told you that. Um, yeah, okay, so Jerry said, Paul, make sure you only have one tab open and make that for your labs. I will tell you this, it's probably not gonna be an issue with you, but it is with your students. If they open another tab, and they have two of them open or often they'll have it open in different windows. Um, it only recognizes the USB in the first tab that you opened. Um, and so when you try to run it, it'll say you're not connected, even though you clearly are. And it'll even look like it's connected. Well, it's because it only it's using web USB and it only recognizes the first tab. So if I close it and go back, now I'm happy again. Um, one way that uh, you can prevent that with students is if they're having that problem, if the first thing they do is reboot their computer, that's gonna kick them off of however many tabs that they have open. Gail said, my micro bit wasn't working. I unplugged it and reconnected again and it worked. Yeah, so USB, um, especially on laptops, that's typically where um, a USB port is one of the first things that will fail on a computer. It's like uh, the old Nintendo, you gotta blow in it and clean it all out. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, let us know, Paul, if you get connected, if you need additional help, um, Lois and Joanna will help you out with that. Um, so that's all that I'm going to share uh, as far as coding with you today, because I want to give you the opportunity to play with that. And I was trying to keep this to about 45 minutes, so we would have plenty of time to answer any other questions. Um, when you get to the end, we'll talk about this, turn in Google Classroom assignment tomorrow. Um, so we'll get to talk about what that is. But hopefully, again, hopefully, all of you were successful in getting your first Python code on. If everybody wants, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So if everybody wants to turn their video on to say goodbye or ask questions of everyone. I never did take a full group class picture of like everybody Brady Bunch style in our Zoom. So we kind of need to do that before. Hi, Dan. Elena did. Oh, did. I already tweeted it. Yeah. Um, it's already yeah. out there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hi, Erin. Oh, there's Terrence again. Yeah. So um, again, if you have any questions, you can ask now, either unmute yourself or in the chat. You can join me in my office hours tomorrow if you'd prefer that. My email, you should have, but it's amber at furialabs.com. Um, what else? One thing I'm seeing from a couple people is even though they put in, they must be with the same, um, with the same Gmail because they're seeing their old progress rather than the current. So is that because they've logged in with their yeah. Gmail that they used before when they were on CodeSpace. Yeah, if you've done any CodeSpace projects before, it's going to remember where you were. Um, so that's good for your students. Uh, maybe not so good for you if you want to start over. 
What you can do, and let me share my screen again real quick, because um, this is what I do. Um, if you go here and delete your account, say yes, delete, it will treat you like you've never done any of the projects before. So if you have had a loaner for a little while and you tried something and you've already forgotten what you did and you want to start over fresh, you can do that um, and that should help. All right, I wanted to say everybody, um, welcome. It's awesome. Um, I, it's, it's always a little tedious to get started, just like you're all teachers, you know how that is. And I think we're gonna really start rocking and rolling. Um, have fun coding, um, have fun doing this on your own and um, I'm looking forward to each time that we get together. Absolutely. And um, you, now that you're in, like, please feel free to go through as much as you want to. Um, this is the only day that I'm really going to be holding your hand through every step. Um, from here on out, we're really going to be talking about how you apply this to a classroom setting. Um, so we're going to be addressing you more as the teacher instead of the student. So as a student, again, if you want to ask for help, then email me or come to office hours and I will, I will help you as much as you need it. And there, there is a rule that, um, that, that I didn't mention. No shyness. Don't be shy. <laughs> if you have a question, ask. Yeah, if you want to know all the stupid stuff I did when I first started learning how to do this, um, I'll tell you, but trust me, we all have to start somewhere and it's just what we want to model for our students. We'll continue to learn, we'll continue to take risks and try something new. Um, and when they see us doing that, then they are going to feel more comfortable doing the same. And that's what we want them to do. So it should be okay, even though we have the code bot, we should be able to follow along with the, you know, with the examples and things like that. It's... Yes, absolutely. Um, so again, we've got the code bot, which uh, Terrence is working in a coding academy, high school coding academy. Um, and so his students are a little bit more advanced and are starting with code bot. Um, but all of the applications of teaching are going to be the same. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Thanks. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You guys too. And everyone stay well. It's been yes. great talking to you. I will see. I'll send out the reminder for tomorrow. Register if you want. But again, remember, this is really going to apply to classroom teachers, which is most of you. Um, who are using the virtual tools. And now Melissa has to go and grade websites, all 78, 78 ah! of them. Oh, a lot. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Um, high school setting. Do I saw I that? Need... Paul, are you still here? Yeah, you can unmute yourself. So we get that question a lot. Um, it really depends. What you're going to see with the micro bit is it's a very gentle approach to Python. So if your students have not done any text-based coding before, then the micro bit is where I would start them. The projects are not dumbed down. They are not written at a level that's going to insult their intelligence. Um, and when we do the remix projects where they have to apply what they've learned, they're going to come up with some really awesome projects. The micro bit is definitely accessible for high school students. Um, Joanna, why don't you jump in since you have experience with that? Yeah, so just to give you a little perspective, I've only been working with this curriculum for, I think it's only been like a month because we were at training okay. mid-February. Pathfinders was it's, just it, a it month like ago. Um, I did winter Pathfinders with Barry and Amber and Lois. And I brought the micro bit back into my classroom, day one, launched it with my students. Um, just as more of a review to get down to basics, they had already been programming in Python and adhesive, but I wanted something that was gonna be physical computing. And I was worried about, is this gonna to be too easy for them? Um, they had some, some programming experience, but had never worked really with physical items that they had to program. They loved it so much, even though they were breezing through at a quicker pace than what Amber and Lois kind of said students would be at for beginning programming, that they were like, can we do it again next Friday? Can we have physical computing a Friday, every Friday? So I only, um, after the training, I had 
10 jumpstart kits in one code bot. And what I did is I just rotated my one code bot um, around to different students until we went remote. Um, and then everybody else was kind of working on the micro bit and, and was able to rotate it. They were able to work through things on their own and it worked out really well. And they loved being able to program open to hardware rather than just doing software or data structures all the time. You, you want to wave to the teacher? Okay, <laughs> I'm waiting for the store to open. Room trying to be quiet. He wants to play with his train. Um, but I would say if you are launching this in the middle of the year and have students who have been doing Python programming, that the code bot's going to give you a greater challenge level. But certainly high school students can start out with the micro bit and then transition into the code bot probably like after a quarter or into mid-year and you can use both of them together to create a full year curriculum. Does that help? Hi. Hey. So, uh, so I have, I have kids in both camps. I have one set of kids that are starting out that I've, that I've used the micro bit on and it's really good and I the, but the platform is really good for that. I have another bunch of kids who are on their first robotics team and have a really hard time with Java and the plan was to do what have you got Python with them as a way of introducing it but also give them the, the physical computing piece. And I'm kind of in this um, hybrid place now where I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be an English teacher, but I'm really a computer science teacher. <laughs> and I'm also going for my national boards. Yay! So, so yay! <laughs> I'm working what on that component? next week. What component are you working on? I'm working on component two and component four. Oh, four is a I know, thing. I know, the data. Oh. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Anyway, <laughs> but what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to plan out a summer program where I would use both the micro bit and the way we call it, the bot, to be able to bring kids in and have it scaffolds. Because mm -hmm. the truth is I'm trying, like I work in the city and the, 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 the level of STEM in the city, and I think I've spoke to Jerry over this a couple of times, is very, is very inconsistent and I'm trying to build up a community in the Bronx with it. So that's part of like my, my uh, advocacy at the moment with both of those, both of the platforms. But I love the, the interface you have. It's really excellent. So, Paul, would it be helpful if, um, if I sent you a loaner bot so that, you know, as you're working, you know, with the, um, with the micro bit, when, when it's time for you to then, you know, move on, depend, depending on how quickly you go through the jump start, um, would that be helpful so that you could see what all is yeah, involved? That, that's what I want. That's what I wanted to do. And I was actually like looking at um, I'd maybe buying like 10 licenses or something because I have a small group of kids that I would work with and use that as a pilot. And what, I'm, what I really want to do, what I really want to do is I want to really see if I can get these, um, these uh, micro bits or micro bits into the hands of some of my kids in the city in the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks and just let them hack out. Because I had one kid who's um, he's, uh, really got attendance issues. He's got huge attendance issues but he's got the highest Lexile level in his grade as ninth grade. And he came into me a couple of weeks ago and he said, I said, he said, what's going on? He says, I was up all night. I was trying to learn Python. So he's a perfect candidate for this. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, okay, well, you can do the writing, make sure you write the journals, but let's try this. So I'm trying to reach out to a couple of kids like that and have them do the English, do that what they're supposed to do, pass the exams, all that, but also give them the opportunity to be in Python really differentiate with that so that's my that's my goal and i have a couple of uh, micro bits here that you know i can land out to the kids to be able to do but if it's going to cause a problem with getting on to the freer labs then i want to be able to like work my way through that with the kids as well as far as the micro bit i'm am i muted no yeah. go ahead oh okay i was fine um, no, it's, i'm I was using like... it for remote learning amber um when I got the Jumpstart kit, I got 10. And before we went into remote learning, they gave us like 24 hours for kids to come and pick up stuff. Um, so I emailed all my students and said, look, if you want to continue with Jumpstart, I need you to pick up the hardware. So they're working on Jumpstart remotely from That's home. Fantastic. And yeah. then they're reaching out to me on either Zoom or Google Hangouts if they get stuck and sending me their program code and I can help them debug it. So 
I know you guys are in a remote learning situation, but I'm finding that it's scaffolded enough that while we're in this weird new sense of normal, that students with um, enough kind of technical background yeah. skills can figure yeah. it out. If you already have micro bits um, that you're just like looking to add the license, the trick is gonna be make sure you update the firmware on the micro bit that you have and make sure that it's working before you send it to your kid. Okay. Sometimes that's a little wonky because I had some um, that I reprogrammed for my students or I had one student who had her own at home and was like, I want this to work so I can work on it at home out of class when the hardware wasn't there before we went remote. And um, I had to work with David, the creator of all this, um, to kind of figure out how to program that. Uh, to do the reset because it, it wasn't working. So I would make sure that you kind of go through those steps and if you need help, Amber knows how to get a hold yeah, of that's, that's that. Yeah, that's my plan. Walking through that, having done yeah. it. Hey, hey, Paul, so you, are you saying that you already have micro bits that you can, um, I, have, I have I have micro bits and I'm, what did you call it, with, I worked with them with, in my old school and with, what did you call it, with the kids that I have on the robotics team. And they're okay. really good with that. Great. What about the um, the components, the, the peripherals and such? Um, do you have those? The which? The speaker. Uh, the sensors. Oh, yes, I have those. Yes, yes. They're, they're here. Okay. They're here. Okay. The extra power yeah. supply. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The yes, speaker. I have all these. Yes, I have all these. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. And I can send you the um, quick link to how to update the micro bit to the okay. firmware okay. that we have. Okay, great. Um, Look, Lois just did it. Lois, you're so good. Okay, yay. <laughs> so yeah, again, you do not, just to make sure, I know there's some other people not on video that are still listening in. You do not need to update the firmware on a micro bit you got from us. But right. micro bits are everywhere. If you have yeah. micro bits you got somewhere else, that's what we're referring to. Not, I just don't want anyone to be confused by that. Okay, so that's perfect, that's perfect. And I think Joanna was going to show you something to show how you can, you know, mail it to your so, students. Amber told us these are photo containers. They're four by sixes. So if you're looking to mail these out to your students, um, you can <laughs> put what I use. At Michael's in a set of like 24 that walk into a larger container. Um, okay. And then it'll keep those smaller components together for them. Um, Perfect. And they were on sale. Yeah, we all have our own like, little boxes. Yeah, okay. here's yeah, another one. Boxes. It helps to keep okay. like the photo sensor and all those other things okay. together so Great. that the kids don't lose those components and that they don't get wrapped in shipping. Okay. All right, ladies. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. And we can oh, continue our conversation on email if you think of anything else. Yeah, yeah. Paul, did you did you want me to get a bot headed to you? Yeah, please, because then I can then I can play around with and what have you got? I really want to the, the, the team are doing some 3D printing and now they're going to work on the bot and it will be ideal for them to work remotely. Okay, do, do me a favor and email me your address just in case I don't have it. Well, because well, I would only have your school. So email me your home address. So okay, okay, that's where you sent, that's where you sent this oh. to. I mean, okay, then I got it. Okay. okay, all right, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Talk to Anyone you. else? <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Okay, great job. Thank you all. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thank you, you tomorrow, everyone right? who's okay. still listening, and we will see everyone tomorrow. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Bye.